I see a show of hands of anyone who at some point in their life have really messed up. I mean, really messed up. And when that happened, you thought that there could be no possible way that God could or would ever forgive you. Well, if I were to guess, I believe that every one of us would be raising our hands. Good morning and thank you for joining us today as we enter into our time of worship together. I encourage you to stay with us following worship for more on some real people who messed up and what happened to them. Good morning. Let's be standing for our first song, please. Ooh, to Christ be the glory. seated. Good morning, church. It is so good to see you. You know, one of my fears is anytime we have a gathering this large, that someone may escape, if you will, without getting spoken to um, and given a handshake or even a holy kiss. So if you don't mind for just one second, Will you look to your left, to your right, to your front, to your back, and just say hello real quick. Go ahead. Psychology tells us that the smile can go a long ways. But I'm here to tell you that the Spirit tells us that the love that Christ puts in each of us goes through eternity. And to be able to share this life with so many different brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and grandparents, Don Hudson, all those that we get to share this life together. Aren't we, of, mo of all people, the most blessed? We're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, thank you for coming our way. We hope you'll stick around and let us all get to meet you at the end of our service. Can we go to God's Word as we start this morning? Look in Psalm cha uh, chapter 16, if you don't mind, or Psalm 16 
uh, starting in verse 5. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have, not, have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be forsaken. God is faithful all the time. We're glad you're here. Let's worship the one that never forsakes us. If you would bow with me to pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today on this first day of the week because we believe that you wrote, us, wrote yourself into our story, that Jesus, his feet touched the dirt and the soil and walked the roads and that he became our savior, that he lived a life of perfection, that he suffered for us, that he knows what it means to know loss of a friend, to know death. He also knows what it means to conquer over that father. He knows what it means to be resurrected again, to be the savior of the world. And because of that, we are here to worship you, Father. You, the great God. You, the only God. You, the God of creation, the God that spoke this world into existence, Father. We worship you, Father, and we praise you because you alone are worthy of praise. Father, we know that you know that there are people among us that don't feel good. They're hurt, they're lost, they're lonely, physically, mentally, uh, and in different ways, Father. Circumstances in their lives, things that may be weighing heavily on their mind this morning, Father. Father, we ask that you deliver us from those things so that we may worship you with all our being, that we may bow down, that we may submit, that we may be your people, good and faithful servants that live in repentance and live a life well-pleasing to you. Father, you love us not because we're beautiful, but because you want to make us beautiful. Lord, don't let us resist that. Let us be your people. Lord, let us, let us accept and nourish the blessings that you pour out onto this congregation through wisdom, through the elders, and what to do with the great funds and the great philanthropy that people share with this church body. For all the people here that have given so greatly, we ask your blessing on them. Lord, be with us today as we worship you and let it be a sweet, sweet scent, a sweet offering to you, Father. We ask this in your son's name, amen. I'm gonna ask that you stand with me for this song, please. Who has held the oceans in his hands?
please read along with me this morning from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. There is love that came for us. This is a time we set aside each week to pray over the offerings of this church and the great privilege of giving back. Today at 3.30, we'll have the registration for our Walk for Water effort. The actual walk begins sometime around 4. Many of us learned of Walk for Water many years ago as one of the Christian charities that actually does things like builds wells in places where there are no wells nearby. There's a lot of wells in the Bible. There's at least eight that have names, and Isaac's wife was found at a well in Genesis 24. Jacob's wife was found at a well in Genesis 29. And Moses' wife was found at a well in Exodus 2. You probably know the story also of Jesus and the woman he met at the well in John 4, and how as he began to talk to her, he told her about a water that he could provide that once it was available, you would never thirst again. That story is a reminder that building a well is important. We all need water. But building a well is not just important because we need water. Building a well or sharing a meal or providing clothing or shelter becomes a platform on which people who have never heard the name of Jesus before get to hear it for the first time. Or maybe people who have heard it before get to hear it again in a new way. So as you think about the things that you want to support, the places where you want to dedicate your efforts, your talents, and your funds, think about those things that become a platform, 
a place like a well, where people, instead of traveling miles and miles and miles, can go to a place nearby where they have time to stand or sit and talk, to hear scripture read, to hear about Jesus. Let's pray. Good Father, we just thank you so much that one of the privileges you've given us is to take from among those things that you have provided to us and to rededicate them, to recirculate them as a way of serving and worshiping you and serving each other. We thank you for this church and for all the things that she is involved in. We pray that each one is a glory to you. We pray also that as we engage in these things, whether it is through money that we have or through goods that we've acquired and are ready to part with or gifts of talent that you've given us, we pray that we can do each one of these things in a way that says we know where these things came from and we know to whom they must return. We thank you so much for Jesus, the power and the presence he has in our lives. We want to spread his name. We want to proclaim his greatness. And we want to use these material things, these physical skills, as a way of doing that. Bless the hands that administer these funds. Take what we have and multiply it. We know you can and we know you will. We pray in your son's name. Amen. In just a moment, Coach Starks is going to come lead us in the Lord's Supper in a very meaningful way. But before that, let's sing this old song that reminds us of the cross. All in the church. Thank you uh, so much uh, for just allowing me to be here and to, to lead uh, this portion of our worship. Uh, I never take these things for granted. Uh, this, I always look for something. When someone asks me to do something like this, I always look for uh, a sign from the Lord to put on my heart to kind of share with you. And this morning, uh, I was thinking, you know, Lord, what do you have for me? And I get up this morning and I come downstairs and I'm not a big coffee drinker. I, I have some creamer and add a little coffee to it is what I do. Uh, and I sit down on the couch and I look over and Skylar is sitting in Becky's lap and they have the Bible open. 
and they're reading scripture. And I'm like, man, you've done it, haven't you? <laughs> you've done it. And I sat there and I thought, you know what, man, Lord, that's what I wanted. That's what I prayed for. My wife and my daughter sitting there reading scripture and they're reading 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, 6, 6, 18, which is Becky's favorite scripture. It talks about praying continually, giving thanks in all circumstances, rejoicing always. It talks about that. And scholars reading it out loud, and I'm like, this is unbelievable. And so I started thinking about the blessings of life that we have and how sometimes we spend our time living in lack and instead of abundance. We start there all the time. And a few things happened this week. Got to watch my son play football, got to hear people pray, got to do those things. I'm thinking, you know what? Man, life's good. And I got here this morning and I've heard Scott talk, Don Lee singing, Sagers are still holding hands since the last time we had uh, this. And I'm thinking, man, what a blessing this life is. And as I read this morning, we go to the Lord in prayer for, for the sacrifices given to us. In Titus chapter three, verse three through seven, it talks, starts really lacking and then gets to the abundance. Listen as I read for you. Titus 3, 3 through 7. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hatred, hated by others and hated one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. As we share in communion this morning, may that, may that we leave lack and live in abundance because of what the Lord has done for us. Pray with me. Father, we're so thankful that you sent Jesus to die for us and to just save us when we didn't deserve it. As we prepare to take this bread, may, Father, that you will go into us and your spirit will live there. May we take it as a remembrance of your body that was on a cross for us. Father, we ask you'll help us to walk your son, walk, live as he lived. Help us love you with everything we have and love others of ourselves. Help us to win the day because you made it. In Jesus' name, amen. Pray with me for the cup. Father, we ask that you are with us this morning as we uh, take this cup as a representation of the blood that was shed, Father, for people who didn't deserve it, but you wanted it your way, and we're thankful for it. As we take this, Father, may we pour it into us and live it out each and every day of our lives. Help us to love you, Father, with everything we have, to love others, love ourselves. Help us win the day because you made it. In Jesus' name, amen. Describe a love that goes for me.
scripture reading this morning is from Romans 12, verses 3 through 6. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith. It's now time for the children to go to the sunshine class. If you're visiting with us and have a child ages two through the second grade, we would love for them to participate in that class. If you'll just get them to this double door, they'll be taken to the class while we sing this song. Come and see the sunshine. stand for the song before Scott's message this morning. If you have a Bible, good morning, church. Matthew 25 is where we'll be today. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Honored to be a part of this uh, wonderful church. I really appreciated uh, what uh, Coach Stark said. I call him Speedy, by the way. We can all call him Speedy. Did you know that? Uh, I was on a Lipscomb event in Memphis, and I went to it, and everybody kept asking me if I knew Speedy. And I was like, who is Speedy? And I found out that was what Kevin Stark's nickname was. Uh, when he played basketball uh, there years ago. 
Uh, but I appreciated the, that thought today, and I'm just so grateful for our church. And I try to tell people regularly that there's more love per square inch here at the Green Hills Church than anywhere else I know. And that, that's one of the things that just means so much, uh, is how we love each other. And it's been fun to see how that's expressed itself over uh, the month, and even uh, last Sunday, it was so fun to just see how we love each other. Uh, we had a wonderful mission Sunday last Sunday. Then we had this big party on the lawn in the afternoon, uh, fall fest, and it's just wonderful uh, to see what God does when people come together and they really, really love each other. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about how to invest your life. We're back in a series that really tries to remind us that God made us to work. And it's interesting, uh, Andy Bedingfield was telling me about a book that came out that basically pointed out that in America, slavery, on top of all the other ills that it brought upon the scene, it also created a, a misunderstanding about work and about the fact that work is a gift that God gave to each one of us that God has given us gifts and talents and the ability to work and that we should be proud of the fact that we work, not trying to figure out how not to work while other people work. And so this is a gift that God gives us, is this opportunity to work. So how are you going to use all those hours that you spend at work? Some of us will waste them really not doing anything that fulfills the purpose that God gave for us. Some will spend our life, but we'll look back and we never really enjoyed our work. But others of us will ask the question, how do we invest our life so that our work is part of our discipleship? It's part of the calling that God has placed upon our life. But for that to happen, we've got to be intentional about things, intentional about them. I wanted to remind you that if you aim at nothing, you hit it every time but you really don't accomplish much with your life. I love this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I think I've asked you before, that third word in verse 27, how do you say that word? You see it? The third word in verse 27. Turn to the person next to you and tell them how to pronounce that word. Buffet. Oh, I heard a buffet over there, huh? Yeah, the difference between buffet and buffet is a really big difference, isn't it? Yeah. To buffet our body means that we just give whatever we want, uh, that we constantly are giving in to things. And then the other is to say, I'm going to buffet my body. I'm going to put discipline upon my body. I'm going to think deeply about things that matter. And what I want us to do <clears throat> in this series is to think about personal responsibility. That, um, am I using my work hours well? <clears throat> Two weeks ago, excuse me, uh, we asked the question, who owns the pond? <clears throat> you might remember the old phrase from um, Maimonides that said, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. But then somebody else came in and said, yeah, but the real question is, who owns the pond? And we talked about the principle of God's ownership, that God owns the pond. God owns everything. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And we talked last time about money and how money is a principality and power that comes that has incredible power behind it. If you lay a piece of paper on the back table, it doesn't really excite anybody unless it's a $100 bill with Benjamin Franklin's picture on it. And then all of a sudden, that piece of paper has incredible power, doesn't it? And what money is, is this power that can be used for good or for ill in our lives. It can drive us towards things that honor the kingdom of God, or it can drive us away. And so we wanted to understand that God owns it all. And today, we want to build on that by talking about God's allocation of his resources. And we'll speak about this again a little bit later, but if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 25, uh, beginning in verse <clears throat> 14. Jesus is speaking, and this is towards the end of his life, right before he goes to the cross. And in verse 14, it says, Again, it will be like a man 
going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. That's the principle of ownership, right? It's God's property. He entrusted it to them. To one, he gave five talents of money. A talent of money, we'll call it bags of gold, but what you need to think about is that it is an incredible amount of money. It would be years and years of wages for most servants. And one received five talents, another two talents, and another one talent, each according to his ability. Then the master went on a journey, and the man who received the five talents put them to work, and the one who received the two talents put them to work, but the one who received the one talent buried it in the ground. And we'll continue reading through this parable every time we come together for the next few weeks. But what I wanted us to notice so far is that the master owns it all. If we don't get that part right, we're really making a big mistake. The principle that God owns it all. You've been entrusted with it for a little while. And the idea that the one who dies with the most toys wins doesn't work. Because basically when you die, everything is gone for you. Because you don't own any of it. It's just been entrusted to you for a period of time. It's God's wealth entrusted to you, but you don't receive ownership, just stewardship. And so today we want to build upon this by noticing the principle of allocation. That God's gifts and God's talents have been entrusted to you Here's the key, according to what you can handle well. According to your ability. Now, most of us think, I could actually handle a lot more than I've got right now, right? It's kind of like uh, Tevia from uh, The Fiddler on the Roof, that uh, I would like to be uh, cursed with more money. And he prays to God, please curse me more, you know. Uh, I can handle it. But we all have this temptation to believe we can handle more. But what God sees in us is let's give you some and see how you do. Let's give you some gifts and talents. If you had a million dollars, would you really give it all away? Well, here's a hundred. I'm watching. And God wants to see what you do with the gifts that have been given to you. So this morning, quickly, I want to talk to you about God's vast resources. Then I want to mention God's gifting to each of us. And then I want to close by talking about how can we manage well and, if possible, how can we manage more. And I hope that this can be helpful to us. So God's vast resources. I loved uh, what Coach Stark said in his comments today because God really does own it all. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. In Psalm 50, it tells us that every animal of the forest belongs to God. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. Every bird, every insect of the field, the whole world is mine. God owns it all. So notice this. If God owns it all, our greatest need cannot exceed God's great resources. Do you catch that? If God owns it all, there's nothing that I need that is beyond the scope of God's great resources. That's pretty elementary, isn't it? If God owns it all, he can handle what concerns me today. He's got it. It's well within his grasp. God has the treasury. God has all the wealth that there is. God has all the gifting that there is. And notice when Paul prays for the church in Ephesians chapter 3, there's two phrases in this prayer, this wonderful prayer that I was so grateful my parents made me memorize when I was young. Uh, it says, for this reason... I kneel before the Father from whom all uh, family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And then look in verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches. Paul was saying, I pray that out of God's deep pockets, 
he would strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith and that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how high and long and wide and deep is the love of Christ and to know a love that surpasses knowledge. Now look in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Paul is praying this prayer out of a realization of God's great abundance. That God's pockets are full. And that out of his abundance, he can give to you. If you're going to use it well. If you can be trusted with it. How many of us have that attitude toward God? Do we have an abundance that God has deep pockets? That God can handle whatever's concerning me today? Do we have a confidence that God can handle my problems and other people's problems at the same time? That God can handle it all? And that it's not too much for him? I really think so many of us have a scarcity understanding of God. And I don't know where this comes from. It might be part of our Puritan past. It may be part of the Great Depression. It may be part of just the way we think about things. But we don't even often ask God for the things that we want or need or hope for or desire or dream or the visions that we have because we don't see God as a God of abundance. And so we don't pray. We don't ask. And so look what... Paul will say in Philippians chapter 4. Notice what he says. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Paul said, God's got me covered and he's got you covered and he can handle both. We're going to be okay. God is not a God of scarcity but a God of of abundance. And if we believe this, we'll pray more. I almost believe that how much we pray will be determined by what we really believe about God's ownership of everything and God's allocation of resources to those who will use them well. And so the second thing I wanted us to notice is that God has gifted to us some of his treasure. It's been given to you according to your ability. So in the parable of the talents, I did want you to know that a talent was a standard of measurement that was primarily not like a single coin that was a talent coin. You know, it's not like there was a, a coin, but it was 6,000 drachmas equal a talent. And look what a talent is worth. A talent is about 20 years' wages for a poor laborer. You catching that? And so one of the servants got one talent, which is 20 years' wages. Another one got two, 40 years' wages. Another got five, 100 years of wages. Why do I say that? Because sometimes we think the one talent person kind of didn't get much. And I want us to realize every one of them, God dumped, or the, 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 the host, the, the, the owner, the manager, the, the one who owned it all, gave a great supply to every one of them. Whether you got one, two, or five, it was a large sum of money that was given. And so what I want us to understand is that word talent from this parable became a way of talking about what God has entrusted to us. It's your time, it's your talent, it's your treasure. That these things that God has given you for a short period of time has entrusted to you are gifts that come from God. And so in Romans chapter 12, it tells us in verse 4 
that God has one body and many members. They don't all have the same function. In Christ, though we are many, we form one body. Each member belongs to the others. And look in verse 6. And we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Some of us are good at some things. Some of us are good at other things. Some of us are gifted in this way. Some of us are gifted in a whole different way. Some of us can do long-term, enduring things. Some of us can give quick bursts of incredible creativity. God's gifted us, and he's gifted us differently. But each one of us have received the gifting that we have from God. Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look what Paul says here. There are different kinds of gifts, but they all come from the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but they all come from the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So you've got talent, I've got talent. God gave you your talent. God gave me my talent. God wants you to use your talent according to your ability. God wants me to use my talent according to my ability. Am I supposed to work? Yes. Are you supposed to work? Yes. Do you retire in the kingdom of God? No. You keep using your gift. You keep using your talent. You keep finding ways that God wants you to make a difference. And so you're all about the kingdom of God. From the day you're baptized till the day you go home, you're working for the Lord, using the gifts that God has given you, entrusted to you. These all come from the same spirit for the common good of the body of Christ. And in verse 11 it says... All these are the work of one and the same Spirit who distributes them to each one just as he determines. So, how do we manage them well? And how do we ask for more? How many of us would like to be more talented, more gifted, more blessed? have a little bit more resources we could use for others. We've got my finance professor over here shaking his head. Yes, okay, we all, we all need a little bit more. So understand that Paul tells this parable about the body of Christ. And in the body of Christ, he reminds us all that we work together. If we all had the same gifts, it would really stink to go to Fun Fest, to Fall Fest. You know what I mean? If all we could do is cook hamburgers and those bologna sandwiches that no one should ever eat, but they're really good. Uh, I mean, what would happen to the face painting? What would happen to the, to the games? What would happen to the... I mean, we begin to realize that you don't have a fall fest if everybody has the same gift. You don't have a church if everybody can only teach cradle roll. We're gifted in various ways. And it's never fair to say that's more important, that's less important. Because what happens in the kingdom of God is it's all important. Some is heightened, some is more hidden, but it's all important. And isn't that what Paul's trying to say? Is that all the parts should have equal concern for each other. I should appreciate your gifting and your talent. And you should appreciate mine. And I shouldn't want your talent. I want to see your talent be used for the glory of God. Matter of fact, on many occasions, I should step back and let you do your thing. Because we all understand it that way. In other words, this is from the movie The Help. You might remember where she says, use kind, use smart, you're important. But the thing that we say here in the church is that you're gifted to. That you have real gifts. You have talents. You have things that matter. You might remember this from Disney as well. Do you remember it? 
mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Yeah. What good outcome comes from comparing your gifts to someone else's? None. Have you ever thought about the possibilities? When I compare my voice to Don Hudson's voice, I, I stink. You know what I mean? Yeah, but when Don compares his voice to my voice, he can have a problem because he can get prideful. Because he can think, man, I'm really good compared to Sager. I'm something else. You know what I mean? And uh, the danger of that is we begin to uh, compare ourselves to others and we're not working together or appreciating one another's gifts. The hardest thing to do, and I tell teachers this all the time because I get to teach the student teachers over at Lipscomb. I said, the hardest thing about being a teacher is that you should want to be the best teacher you can possibly be. You should be driven and you should want to be the very best. And if you love children, you should hope you're the worst teacher in America. Catch that? Yeah. That you should want to be the very, 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 very best you can be and hope that every other classroom in America is even better taught. Because you care about the whole, right? I want to be the best I can be, but I want you to be the best you can be. Because God has allocated resources to you. And you need to use them. So here's a few things as we close. Number one, notice this. God's gifted us according to ability. Okay? If you don't have more, God's waiting to see how you use what you have to see if he can entrust you with more. We'll talk about that more in a couple of weeks. But if you're not using what you have well, it should be obvious to you that God isn't ready to entrust more to you. How are you doing in the job you have now? How are you doing with the resources you have now? How are you doing with the talent that you have now? Are you using it well? According to your ability. The second thing is that you have been gifted amazing talents. C.S. Lewis, in The Weight of Glory, says that your neighbor is the closest thing to a God that you will ever meet. And that if you didn't understand the way things work, you would almost be tempted to worship them. Because he was just trying to say, what God has done inside every human being is really amazing. Have you thought about just how amazing people are? And the talents and the gifts and the treasures that people are? We should value one another so much more than we do. We should appreciate the gifting that God has given to other people so much more than we do. We should be so much more grateful for the people who are serving at our church and doing things for our kids and for us, often behind the scenes, just very, very, very appreciative of what they are doing. A talent is what God has given you, and what you do with it is your gift back to God. What you do with what God has given you. And remember, the final question will be asked by God and not by you. You see, when you get to heaven... You're not going to get to ask the questions. God's going to ask the questions, right? And the question is going to be, what did you do with the talents that I entrusted to you? How did you do with what I gave to you? Did you use it well? Were you a, an asset where you were? Did you make a difference? That's the question that will be asked. The question that we would like to ask is, God, why didn't I get more? Why wasn't I blessed in another way? Why wasn't I offered more resources or, or more opportunities? Or, you know? And what's interesting about that is it may be that we didn't pray and ask God for it. You know, there was a prayer. It's called the prayer of Jabez. You remember when it was all the rage? It kind of got out of whack and it seemed like a real like, materialistic prayer. But if you really look at it the way that it was first uttered, it's a really good prayer. Look what it says. Jabez prays, Oh God, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. 
What would that sound like today? It would sound like, en enlarge my influence. I'd like to impact more people. I'd like for my life to make a bigger difference. And uh, that you'd keep your hand on me. And that you would keep me from evil and from causing anyone pain. Do you see that if you want more from God, you really ought to ask for it? And you ought to ask for how can you increase your influence for the kingdom of God? How can I do more for you, God? That's what I want. And so we can pray about that. But you know, there's another prayer in the book of Proverbs that really kind of balances this prayer of Jabez out. It didn't get as much play. Um, let me come back to that passage in a minute. It doesn't get as much play, but have you all heard of the prayer of Agur from Proverbs chapter 30? Prayer of Jabez got lots of, of print. Prayer of Agur, look what it says. Two things I have asked of thee, deny me them not before I die. That's King James for, I want these two things before I die. And the first one is, remove from me falsehood and lies. And then notice this part. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is God? Or lest I be poor and steal and use profanely the name of God. Agur says, be careful not to ask for more than you can handle. Ask for the talents, the gifts, the resources that you can use well for the kingdom of God. So let me close by reminding you of a parable that you know, not even a parable, a story that you know quite well. Do you remember there was a day when people came to Jesus and they said, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And you might remember that Jesus said, hey, toss me a coin. And somebody flipped him a coin and he caught it. He held it up and he looked at it. And he said, hey, whose picture is this? on this coin. And they said, oh, that's Caesar's picture on this coin. And do you remember what he said? He said, you should give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and you should give to God the things that are God's. Whose image are you? In whose image were you created? Yeah. God's. You were created in God's image. And you are to use your life as the coin of the realm. You are to use your life and to understand that your life and your talent is on loan from God. And the question is, how will you invest your life? That's the question of the morning. Will you give God what is His, understanding that it's all been allocated to you by Him? Now, we never close without reminding ourselves that we became God's when we were baptized. And what you said on the day that you confess Christ as your Lord is that he has reign and rule over me, that I want my life to be used for his glory. Your baptism was a baptism participating in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ so that you would come up out of that water willing to live as Christ would live in you. And so where you go into the workforce, you go as Christ. Where you serve in the community, you serve as Christ. When you interact with your neighbors in your neighborhood and your community, you serve, you interact, you bless as Christ would. You are the coin of the realm. And what we understand today 
is that the gifts given to you have been allocated to you by God to be used. If you've never given your life to Christ, today's the day you should do that. You should confess Him as your Lord and be baptized into His name. If you've been playing around with your life, if you've been wasting your life, spending your life, but not investing your life in things that matter, I hope that as we sing this invitation song, you'll pray, God, help me to get a little bit more serious today about what my life is really all about. Don't let me look back at the end and realize I wasted the opportunities to be the blessing that you wanted me to be. And if we can help in any way, that's why we're here, and we encourage you to come to the front as we stand and sing. what's going on um, up here to ask you guys for something again unfortunately <laughs> or fortunately actually because it's something really awesome so today is walk for water as I think you've all heard um, and so it's at 3 30 today and what we need from everybody is number one participation um, which I think is really important just to be here be present hear more about what we're doing and hear why it's important but I want to share a little bit with you about what we're doing and what we've done in the past um, and why it's impactful. So we all take clean water for granted, I think. I think it's something that we just walk in our kitchen, turn it on. Not sure natural water is super clean or not. I mean, most of us have filters probably. But anyways, with that being said, clean water, something super important to us being able to live, right? And we have easy access to it. Well, something that we do for Walk for Water is provide wells for communities that are in need of that clean water. Um, Communities that just don't have it and have to give a, a ton of effort just to get it for their families. Um, in the past, we've done a really great job of meeting and exceeding goals here as a church for Walk for Water to build wells in communities. Um, just for reference, um, I'll go back a couple years here, but in 2019, we raised almost $12,000 and put a well in, in Zimbabwe at, um, I can't pronounce it, Makatenda Primary School, which is really awesome. Um, in 2021, we set a record for our giving here with $15,000. And we put a well in Nigeria, which I'll tell you a little bit more about here in just a second. Last year, we, gained, we, we uh, raised $10,000. Um, this year, we're asking for $7,500 to build a well somewhere. Um, in the grand scheme of things, $7,500 to provide clean water for an entire community. Think about, a, think about if the entirety of Green Hills didn't have clean water and a $7,500 well providing clean water for everyone in this community. It's not a whole lot of money, really, considering what you're providing. So I wanna read one thing to you and then I'll be out of here. So, Healing Hands often says it all begins with water. So with our support from 20, 2021, which is when we raised $15,000, we were able to provide clean water in Nigeria for more than 5,100 people, 5,100 people gives those families, men, women, children, the opportunity to drink clean water and to experience the love of Christ through this mission. Uh, I think this serves as a testament um, to you guys for what you've done in the past. 
and for what we're capable of doing now. I think it's something that's really, um, you know, that everyone can be a part of in some way. And so we're asking for that. Um, that well is at the Nigerian Christian Bible College in Nigeria. And uh, again, we're asking for, um, for 7,500 this year to do the same thing for another community. Um, so today at 3.30, be there. Um, find Summer or I after service, and we can tell you how to kind of get online and give that money. I don't know if we have a QR code or anything queued up here for that, um, for you guys to scan, but it's really simple and really easy to get plugged in. So I hope to see everyone there. Thank you, Aaron. It's a wonderful event. Let's stand and sing our closing song. Our children will join us and then we'll be dismissed. Mm -hmm. Oh, they tell me of the whole story of the missed. I'd like a show of hands of those who have really messed up and you felt that there was zero chance that God could ever forgive you. Yes, that's what I thought. I believe each of us can pinpoint at least one major goof up, okay, sin that we've committed for which we feel that God could never forgive. With that realization, how did that sit with you? I know I felt lower than dirt. Not only did I perhaps let myself down or even my family, but more importantly, I let God down. And that's a heavy burden. And in my limited human mind, I've rationalized that there was zero possibility that God could do what I thought was completely unthinkable. Forgive me. It was impossible. It was all over. So just open the gates of hell and let me step right through. You know, we're not the only ones who felt this way. Look at three people from the Bible, David, Peter, and Paul. It's easy to think of our Bible heroes as maybe even, a be, even being a bit like superheroes. Often we place these individuals on pedestals, the old knight on a white horse syndrome. We may idolize them as people who, although we know they were humans, we tend to overlook their flaws because of their greatness. Although we revere them as holy, chosen people of God, they were everyday, ordinary people who God used to bring about his plan. These people had real lives not dissimilar from yours or mine. Yes, we may rationalize that they didn't live in the 21st century. They didn't face the issues that we encountered because they lived in a time when things were simpler and life was less complicated, right? We remember David as a young man who had not only slayed a lion and a bear, and he killed Goliath, but he also was known as a good king. 1 Samuel 13, verse 14 says, David was a man after God's own heart, but he was human. David was all of those aforementioned things, but his lust and poor choices also led him to become an adulterer and a murderer. 2 Samuel 11. 
Even when he thought he had successfully covered up his mistakes, God still sought him by sending Nathan to reveal the sin in his life and recover his relationship with God. 2 Samuel 12. God even used David's bloodline to bring about Jesus into the world. Matthew 1, 6 and 7 tells us this. Jesus called Peter out of the boat to walk on the water, and he did. Peter did miraculous things recorded in the book of Acts. In chapter 3, God heals a man who couldn't walk through Peter. And in chapter 9, a paralyzed man was healed and a dead woman's life was restored by God's power and at Peter's word. Considering these incredible works God did through Peter, it's shocking to think that not long before, on the night of Jesus' crucifixion, Peter vehemently denied even knowing Jesus. What a mess Peter was in. Peter thought his life was over. He was done. Weeping tears of bitterness, no doubt. He never considered a forgiving God. His life was in shambles. The Apostle Paul wrote most of the letters of the New Testament and we read of his incredible missionary journeys that are recorded in the latter half of the book of Acts. We're encouraged by his example of boldness and faith and perseverance despite the difficult circumstances he faced during travels and while he was in prison. Thousands of people heard the good news of Jesus because of Paul and he continued to defend it until his death. Jesus had a specific task in mind when he appeared to Paul on the Damascus Road. And Jesus, in speaking to Ananias in a vision, said of Paul, He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and before kings and the children of Israel. In light of that mighty transformation, it's amazing to remember that before God revealed himself to Paul, he was Saul, the famed Christian killer. And even though David had messed up his personal life, he chose to not allow his sin to define him. David had an overwhelming realization of his sin. However, he chose to live his life differently going forward. Do you suppose that a man after God's own heart would have been attributed to David if he had chosen to continually allow sin to dominate his life? Peter became a driving force in the kingdom of God, known as a leader and one who boldly spoke of Jesus on the first Pentecost following Jesus' resurrection. He could have decided to let his denial of Christ become the defining moment in his life, but even though he undoubtedly remembered his denial, perhaps even daily, he chose God's forgiveness and to be more for Jesus. Paul the writer of the majority of the New Testament books could have allowed his earlier persecution of Christians to dominate his life, but he chose to speak of God's grace on a number of occasions, and his words offer us hope and assurance of the forgiveness that we need. So, what did each of these men have in common? They all messed up. And even though that was the case, each repented, changed their life, and allowed God to use them for his greater plan. So would you like to talk with someone about your mess-ups? Please know that you're not, not the first person who's been in this predicament. We've all been there at some point. You may reach out to us at elders at cocgh.org. We want to help you get back on track so your talents may be effectively used for the kingdom. And no matter what you believe is your mess up, know that God can take your mess and make it into your message. And I'm glad we have examples like David and Peter and Paul because they did have messy lives. But by the grace of God, they allowed those messes to become an effective message that has led countless numbers of people to Jesus. And so it can be with yours and mine as well.